Thank you. you. May be seated. We'd like to just remind you of a couple of things that were mentioned this morning. Uh, you have your acts and facts uh, on the various tables around the auditorium, so we encourage you to pick up one of those. Uh, this issue is on creation and college. A lot of young people starting school very soon, and we always encourage them to go to a Bible-believing Christian school which teaches creationism. There are a lot of schools today which have the name Christian which no longer teach biblical creationism. And so we encourage young people uh, to attend a school where they will be solidified in their faith rather than having their faith attacked and being given bad grades by so-called Christian professors who are determined to undermine what the scripture says on the issue of creation. And then we also mentioned this morning there is a, a sheet of paper which I put out called How to Evangelize a Muslim. And uh, it's very well done. Uh, it comes from the Banner of Sovereign Grace Truth, December 2012. And I think you will find some very practical things uh, in that sheet of paper if you did not pick up one this morning. The other topics, I think, are in the bulletin uh, or other announcements, and so we will uh, dispense with those. Please take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. We began our study last week about circumcision and food fights. The two things that were raised as issues after Peter went to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. An incredible, wonderful story in Acts chapter 10 because that means that you and I have the privilege of being in the body of Christ, that we are no longer excluded as aliens and foreigners, but now we are in Christ Jesus by the grace of God. And it started there in Acts chapter 10. But Peter got a lot of flack for doing what he did in Acts 10 by going into Gentiles, to those who were uncircumcised, and actually eating with them. We begin reading in Acts 11, verse 1. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again as we consider this issue which is so prominent in the New Testament, even more prominent than it is in the Old Testament, we pray, Father, that you will give us wisdom to understand the principles that you use this particular issue to teach the principles that deal with us as Gentiles in the body of Christ, the principles that deal with Jews who have trusted Christ, requiring them to accept Gentiles on a co-equal basis, the principles, Father, that these two issues teach us concerning not only our liberty in Christ, but our responsibility when necessary to cause or to keep from causing a weaker brother to stumble, we restrain our liberty. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings on the going forth of your word tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you recall that last week we talked about the surprising results uh, of looking up all the references to circumcision in the Bible, mentioned only 32 times in the Old Testament, although from the history of Judaism, you would have thought that it was one of the most prominent things that's in the Old Testament law. In the New Testament, it's mentioned 45 times, and that's not even counting uncircumcision, which we will talk about a little bit tonight as well. It's 14 times more it's mentioned, that term uncircumcision in the New Testament, which gives a total of 59 times that either circumcision or uncircumcision are mentioned in the New Testament as contrasted with 32 times of its mention in the Old Testament. As we looked at what happened last week, the news obviously arrived at Jerusalem ahead of Peter getting there, and those who were of the circumcision contended with him. The people who were upset were Jewish believers. It's not the Sanhedrin, as we pointed out last week. These were Jewish believers who wanted to argue with him. We saw a number of different places where 
Paul is called the apostle to the Gentiles and Peter is called the apostle to the Jews, the Jews being the circumcision and the Gentiles being the uncircumcision. We noted that circumcision predates the law of Moses. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, this is Jesus speaking, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. We discover that as we look into the Old Testament and as Stephen mentions in his sermon in Acts chapter 7, and he, that is Stephen, said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come unto the land which I shall show unto thee. And verse 8, And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. We discovered last week that circumcision was important in the Old Testament because it was a sign of faith. It was not a sign of law-keeping. Paul, writing to the Romans and speaking of Abraham, says, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. There was a major division in the early church, and it is a division that continues to this day with Jewish believers who still want to place themselves under the law. We're going to be talking about this in a little more detail as we get further into the message tonight, but the issue that arose among the churches of Galatia, a group of Gentile churches, ancient Gaul, the gospel had spread across Central Europe and was moving west toward the British Isles, Gaul, Galatia, France, we would call it today, the Galatians were being pursued by rabbinic Judaizers who were telling them that faith in Christ was not enough. They were being told that they also had to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised. And they told them that it was necessary for either one of two reasons. Some were pushing for apostate Judaic legalism, and some were pushing for heretical Judaic legalism. Some were saying you had to be circumcised to be saved, and we discover that later on in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So we know that one of the prongs of the circumcision crowd was they were teaching circumcision for salvation. The other way in which it was being taught, the second prong, was you had to be circumcised to be sanctified. In verse 5 of Acts 15 it says, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. These are believers. They're not teaching it for salvation. But they said that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And as we get further into the chapter and as we look at the discussion in the book of Galatians, we discover this was, they were saying, it's the only way that you can be sanctified is if you are circumcised and keep the law of Moses. We find Acts 15, 24, that the council at Jerusalem came to the conclusion announced by James, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It was an issue that had to be dealt with early on in the church because it is an issue that persists even today, especially among Jewish believers in their messianic assemblies. Not all, but among many of them. And so we talked about many different theological issues and we spoke of the dangers of requiring circumcision in a Jewish context because if you put any reliance on circumcision, it's like putting reliance on good works or baptism or church membership or some other external visible work of man. Galatians 5, 2, and 3. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you 
that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Now, I'm going to repeat this because it's important for us to see it in its context. Paul is not saying that if a man was circumcised as a baby, he is stuck with mandatory obedience to the law. Paul himself notes the fact that he was circumcised and he stood firmly against placing believers back under the law. Jesus was also circumcised and did not reverse the process as an adult. We know that both were circumcised because the Bible says so and we quoted those verses for you last week. But you know there's a balance. One of the most important things in the Christian life is balance. Many years ago, I read a book by one of my seminary professors, Dr. Charles Ryrie, called Balancing the Christian Life. Back then, they used the King James Version in the uh, quotations in the text. I think they use something else now. But if you can get a, a copy that is an old copy, uh, I encourage you to pick it up and read it. Because you'll discover that Satan always wants you to go overboard one way or the other. He does not want you to keep balance. God wants us to keep balance. And so we need to understand that in this context, and in many contexts in the Christian life, externals sometimes do matter in the context of either expanding or limiting a ministry. We saw the illustration of Timothy and Titus, one of whom Paul circumcised and one of whom Paul refused to circumcise. And it related to the effective testimony that they would have or would not have because of the context in which they found themselves. Acts 16.3, Paul circumcised Timothy. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And so they assumed, and rightly so, that Timothy was therefore uncircumcised, and that slammed the door of any ministry to the Jews. Now Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, but Paul also went first always to the synagogues to preach Christ. And the word of Timothy traveling with Paul would have reached those synagogues in advance and caused a hardening and a closed door for the spread of the gospel. But Titus was fully Greek. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. We need to understand that many times we give up certain rights willingly for the sake of our testimony for Jesus Christ. We're going to discuss the issue of Christian liberty briefly a little bit later. We've talked about it in detail in the past. But Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want. Christian liberty is the empowerment to do what you ought. And a mature Christian will be willing to restrict certain of his own so-called rights for the sake of weaker brothers, and we'll talk about that in detail tonight, for the sake of those who are lost, for the sake of giving a clear-cut testimony to all around, for the sake of conscience, and we're going to cover some of these things tonight, but Christian liberty is not a matter of insisting on your rights, but of being willing to restrict your rights to help someone else. In any event, the New Testament indicates that circumcision is only wrong when it's required for the religious reasons of salvation or sanctification, and we mentioned many different cultures where it is found. We talked about the scripture being silent on whether circumcision is right or wrong for other non-religious reasons, and we gave you multiple other reasons whereby circumcision may or may not take place, depending on the conscience of the parents or of the individual man. So now we look at the references to uncircumcision because it's actually in those references that we gain most of our theological insights as to why God speaks of it so often in the New Testament 
to teach us certain overriding principles that can be applied to many other areas of practical Christian theology. As we mentioned, we find it again mentioned 14 times uncircumcision, and it is never mentioned in the Old Testament, the word uncircumcision. Now you gain that there are certain people who do not have circumcision who are to be cut off from their people. The lowest level of that, as you look through rabbinic tradition as to how they exercised it, was to exclude someone for a period of time, and if they insisted on whatever sin they had, they would be ultimately put to death. But here we find in the New Testament 14 more times where the term uncircumcision is used as a euphemism for the Gentiles. The clear physical way to tell that a man was not part of the covenant people of Israel. There was no physical way in the Old Testament to tell if a woman was part of the covenant people of Israel, although certain pagan Gentiles, particularly in Africa, mutilated their girls and they still do it today. But principally, male circumcision was used to distinguish Jewish males from, Jewish, uh, from Gentile males. Ephesians 2.11 Wherefore remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. It is a physical sign in the flesh. In the New Testament context, circumcision was used to show that a man was a law keeper. But having the physical sign of circumcision was not a guarantee that a Jew actually kept the law. A circumcised man could be a lawbreaker and an uncircumcised man could be, in reality, a law keeper. Paul says so in Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through 27. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? By using this illustration, Paul proves that justification is not by circumcision, but by faith. He could have chosen something else, but he chose circumcision and uncircumcision to prove that justification is by faith. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and that all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, which is uh, without the law, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. That major discussion of justification in Romans chapter 3 uses as the proof that justification is by faith it uses the terms circumcision and uncircumcision and shows that both are justified by faith, not by an external work that man does. Did you hear verse 30? Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Further, it's not just in the area of justification that Paul uses circumcision and uncircumcision as an illustration. 
but also concerning the blessing of God. That the blessing of God is not restricted to those who are circumcised, that is the Jews, nor is the blessing of God withheld from those who are uncircumcised, the Gentiles. Because, Paul points out, Abraham received the blessing of God before he was circumcised. In other words, while he was still a Gentile. Romans chapter 4. He continues that same discussion in Romans 4, verses 9 and 10. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. If you go back and read Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses, where God gives his blessing to Abraham, and then he restates it in chapter 15, and then he restates it in chapter 17, and then he restates it in chapter 21, God gives his blessing to Abraham over and over and over again before he gives him the sign of circumcision. And Abraham is circumcised, and Ishmael, who is 12 years old, or 13 by that time, is circumcised. God had given the promises and the blessings to Abraham long before he was circumcised. So not only justification is by faith in contrast to justification being by circumcision, but the blessing of God is by faith in contrast to the blessing of God being by circumcision or uncircumcision. Actual obedience to God is far more important than acquiring an external sign. And for us, that should remind us that it also goes for external signs that we practice, baptism, the Lord's table, church membership, and so forth. Paul explains that actual obedience is far more important than external signs in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Actual obedience is far more important than an external sign, whatever external sign you want to cling to. Paul also used the issue of circumcision as proof, and this I found fascinating when I began to study it, he uses the issue of circumcision as proof of the validity of a ministry call to different groups of people. In other words, God can actually make it clear to a young or old person that God has called that person to serve among a specific people group or in a specific location as they head for the mission field. And he uses circumcision as an illustration of proving the validity of a ministry call. Galatians 2.7 But contrariwise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. <laughs> he could have used the Damascus Road experience and used that as his illustration of his call. He could have used his baptism in the house by Ananias as the illustration. He could have used any number of experiences in his life but what does he use to speak of his separate calling to ministry from the calling of Peter? Although Peter was the one who brought the Gentiles in, Peter's call was to the Jews, to the circumcision. And although Paul's call was to the uncircumcision, Paul always went first to the synagogue where the circumcision were located. He uses this as an illustration of a distinct call to a particular ministry. The next thing that we learn as we look at our texts is the profitability of circumcision, which is the radically changed body, is contrasted with the profitability of the radically changed life. In one case, you've got a radically changed body. In the other case, you've got a radically changed life. 
And circumcision is used to show the profitability in contrast. The radically changed life is shown in two different ways in the New Testament using the illustration of circumcision, faith worked out in love, and the new creation in Christ. This is in the context of showing that there is no superiority of the Jewish male believer over the Gentile male believer. Now remember, I've said it before, I hope that by pounding this in every now and then, we'll soon get the context of the book of Galatians so that you'll understand it when you read it. Galatians was written to stop the mouths of the Judaizers who were trying to put the Gentiles under the law either for salvation or sanctification. But here's what Paul writes in Galatians 5 and then what he writes in Galatians 6. In Galatians 5, 6, for in Jesus Christ, very important phrase in Pauline eschatology, by the way, it's Pauline, not Pauline. Pauline is a girl's name. Pauline is the writings of Paul. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Being circumcised or uncircumcised will never help you to have faith that works by love. It will never manifest itself in outward ways. Whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, it will never motivate you to love. The next chapter, chapter 6, verse 15, he says, and once again, the position that we as believers, whether Jew or Gentile, have in Christ. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Instead of putting the emphasis on the radically altered body, the emphasis should be on the radically altered life. One of the things that the Judaizers required was circumcision. Paul says in this context, in Galatians chapter 5, halfway between the two verses that we just read, in Galatians 5.12, that he wishes that those who taught the requirement of circumcision, either for salvation or sanctification, that he wishes those false teachers were cut off. Interesting term. It's a term that means emasculated or castrated, not merely circumcised. Galatians 5.12, I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. There are several different terms in the New Testament translated cut. The term here used is apokopto. That means to amputate. It's also used when Peter cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. And it's also used in the passage where Jesus spoke of having your hand or your foot cut off if it offends you. That's an amputation. Paul says those who are teaching that false doctrine, they're so focused on that, I wish they were castrated or emasculated. In the body of Christ, there are no external differences, man-made or physical heritage, that can count for either salvation or sanctification. Colossians 3.11 Where there is neither Jew, Greek, nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Further, not only is circumcision not necessary for salvation or sanctification or justification or blessing, salvation forgiveness does not depend on circumcision. Likewise, they do not depend on baptism, the Lord's table, church membership, or other works of man. Your forgiveness does not depend on this. Colossians 2.13, And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, made alive, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Circumcision is not necessary for being made alive. Circumcision is not necessary for being forgiven of all trespasses. You see, the Apostle Paul takes something that had become very heavily entrenched in rabbinic Judaism, and which was permeating the church at that time as 
an alternate way of salvation or an additional way of salvation or acquired part of salvation or sanctification. And he gives us principles using this as an illustration so that we will know that there is nothing that must be added for our salvation or our sanctification than faith in Christ. That's very important. And that gives us the perfect transition to the second issue in our text in Acts 11, verses 1 through 3 tonight. The issue of what we might call kosher food and eating with Gentiles. Now we already saw the issue of kosher food in Acts chapter 10, the opening verses where Peter goes into a trance and the sheet descends from heaven and God says to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter tells the Lord, and it's Jesus who's speaking to him there, Not so, Lord, for nothing unclean has ever touched my lips. Um, but now we find other Jews at Jerusalem who are saying you went in and ate food with people who were uncircumcised. You ate with Gentiles. And so we have a perfect transition at this point into that issue. The passage we just read in Romans dealt specifically with questionable foods and the conscience. I skipped those verses so that we could get down to those parts that deal with the food and the conscience. First, back to our text, Acts 11.3, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. <clears throat> so now let's see what the Apostle Paul, under the control of the Holy Spirit, gives as the underlying principles. Remember, he's taught us some principles using circumcision as the illustration. Let's see what he gives us as underlying principles that control this situation. The first test case is vegetarianism. Romans 14, beginning in verse 1 through 4. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him just like with the issue of circumcision versus uncircumcision, God has received them both. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. From these four verses we learn four different principles. Number one, the vegetarian Christian is a weaker brother. Paul says so in context. Another who is weak eateth herbs. But you know, there are some very important principles that deal with weaker brothers. Now I've covered this in detail in the past, so I'll just summarize it here. The man who is the weaker brother is not to continue being a weaker brother. And we've done extensive study on that. We are supposed to grow in Christ. We are supposed to grow in faith. The weaker brother is one who does not have the faith to eat anything except vegetables. The second thing that we need to understand is not only should he grow, but neither should he use it to control stronger brothers in the faith. And Paul explains that here in this context. He says that person who is the weaker brother, who's the vegetarian, should not judge or criticize the stronger brothers who eat anything that they want. There are those who tend to be critical or judgmental on this adiaphorous issue. Neither is the stronger brother to offend the weaker brother, and Paul is going to explain that at the end of the passage. The stronger brother doesn't just say, get a life, you jerk. I'm going to eat this beefsteak whether you like it or not. You see, there has to be balance, not only in the individual's Christian life, but balance within the context of the church, for in the church there will be those who are weaker brothers, and in the church there will be those who are stronger brothers. It may not be on this particular issue. Paul is using two issues in this chapter to teach us the principles of how we as Christians, whether we are stronger or weaker, 
are to deal with the rest of the body of Christ so that we do not have division in the body. Very important principles. The second thing is this is not a point of argumentation and division that God wants in the body of Christ. He says, you receive those who are weak in the faith, but not to doubtful disputations. You know, one of the interesting things that is pointed out in this little um, paper here on how to evangelize a Muslim is that you don't, it says, use tact and be charitable. Don't talk about reprobation with a Muslim or a new convert who has just lost an unbelieving family member. Well, that seems like common sense. But you know, we catch people at different weak points in their life. And we may know a lot of theology, but that's not the time to hit that person with theology that will beat them up. Same thing here. We are to treat one another with courtesy and with love. Be courteous, Peter says. We are to demonstrate our love. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. There is a balance in the Christian life even when we know something that another brother doesn't know. How important is it? And Paul explains that here in this particular context. This is not a point of argumentation and division that God wants in the body of Christ. Receive them, but not to doubtful disputations. The third thing that we learn from those first four verses is this is not a point of superiority for human carnivores over human herbivores. It says, those who eat meat should not despise the weaker brothers. But it is also not a point of superiority for the human herbivores over the human carnivores. They are not to judge those who eat the meat. And then the fourth thing we learn is the reasons for each choice will be judged by God because he is the master of each one of us. Those of you who have been parents know what a pain in the neck it is when one kid runs around always judging and criticizing all the other kids. And then that kid runs around judging and criticizing the ones who criticized him. Those of you who have been teachers see the same thing in the classroom. The one who makes the decisions, the one who makes the judgments, is in the first case the parents, in the second case the teacher. How prone we are to act like children in the body of Christ. Paul goes on in verses 10 through 12 in Romans 14 and says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Quoted out of Isaiah also over in the book of Colossians. And then verse 12, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now as with most dogmatic statements in Scripture, we also need to recognize there is a balance in Scripture. It says, Why do you judge your brother? Why do you set it not your brother? So people will say, so you can't judge me. Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged. Nah. <laughs> the prohibition against judging thy brother applies only to adiaphorous things. That is, things that are neither moral nor immoral. Things that we would call neutral. The food issue is a neutral issue. The circumcision issue is a neutral issue in the body of Christ. That prohibition against judging thy brother applies only to the adiaphorous things. It does not apply to moral defection or doctrinal defection. In those cases, we are commanded to judge. And there's a lot written on this, but I'll just give you a few references out of 1 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 6. Here's one where the church is supposed to set up judges. Judges. 
Chapter 6, verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? So this is a legal issue that's going on here. Something whereby there can be a definitive determination concerning legal rights. Do ye not know that the saints shall... Hello? That the saints shall judge this world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? The correct court for a believer in disagreement with another believer is not the secular courts, but what we would theologically call an ecclesiastical court a court in the church. Now the Presbyterian form of government is set up that way. We have courts that begin with the session of the church and go all the way up to the presbytery and then if you're in a synod or general assembly to the synod or general assembly. And there are those who are defense attorneys and there are those who are the accusatory trial attorneys. And the case is heard by individuals who are appointed to judge. Now that's usually used in terms of theological deviance, but Paul says it can be used in cases which would be taken to a secular judge. Know ye not that we shall, hello out there, that we shall judge angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Very interesting principles in that. Wish we had time to talk about them tonight. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. So the prohibition that Paul, who wrote this epistle just like he wrote Romans, against judging our brother, is in the area of adiaphorous things, things that are neither moral nor immoral. Let me give you an illustration of that out of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Starting in verse 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles. <laughs> Interesting. Writing to a Gentile church. But you see, now they're in the body of Christ. Once the church began, there were no longer two divisions, Jew and Gentile. Now the scripture sees three divisions, Jew, Gentile, and the Church of God. Where Jews and Gentiles who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ are now one in the body of Christ. It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Even the unsaved pagans don't do that, says Paul. And ye, you believers there at Corinth, are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have done a little scolding, said, ooh, no, no, naughty, naughty. Paul says, I already have judged as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, now he's going to call on the church. You say, well, he was an apostle, he could do this. No, he's not there. So he says, you as a church need to do something. 
In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and by spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here is a rather serious form of judgment. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The man that was doing this was not an unsaved person pretending to be a Christian. The man that was doing this was actually saved. It shows you how decadent, how filthy, even Christians can fall back into sin. And Satan loves to see it because it destroys the testimony of Christ. But we also have a wonderful truth illustrated in this which should give any Christian hope even if he or she has fallen into decadent sin. That man did not lose his salvation. Turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Down to verses 12 and 13. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? That is, the unbelievers on the outside. That's not our position to judge them on the outside. Do ye not judge them that are within, those who are in the church, the believers? For them that are without, God judgeth. And we see plenty of that in the book of Revelation. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. The church corporate, excluding and excommunicating a person, and in the wickedest cases, turning them over to Satan, and God using Satan as the final instrument of their chastening to kill them, lest they bring worse shame to the name of Christ. Remember we talked this morning about how we're a cup. We are a vessel that bears the name of Christ. A cup that is to be overflowing with the fullness of the Spirit of God. A cup that is to be overflowing and refreshing others with goodness and mercy. You can see why God allows Satan to kill Christians who refuse to bear the name of Christ in honor and in sanctification, in holiness and in purity. Too many Christians ignore these teachings, especially in this modern American culture. They think anything goes. And after all, God is a God of love and God is a God of forgiveness and I can get away with it anyway because I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven. They do not understand the chastening hand of the Lord or what God expects of them that he might use them as a vessel that has been purified. God uses clean vessels. Do you want to be used by God? God uses clean vessels. The second issue here that Paul deals with to teach the principles of discernment here in Romans 14, because this takes us back to all that's going on in Jerusalem that cauldron of disagreements and attacks on Peter for having gone into Gentiles, for Peter having eaten with Gentiles, for Peter eating unclean food with Gentiles. The second issue that Paul deals with here in Romans 14, to teach principles of discernment, is Sabbatarianism, shorthand for one of the two main areas concerning the so-called Sabbath, those who still do Sabbath keeping on Saturday, such as the Seventh-day Adventists, or those who call Sunday the Christian Sabbath, which many in our camp would fall into, and then trying to infuse Sunday with either all or part of the Old Testament law concerning what may be done or what may not be done on the Sabbath. 
which they have now plunked down on Sunday. Briefly, Sunday has never been made the Sabbath. Sunday is the first day of the week. Christians worked on, worshipped on the first day of the week not because God made it into a new Sabbath, but because Christ rose from the dead. And the scripture says so. Saturday is still the Sabbath, and it has always been the Sabbath. So if we are under the Sabbath laws, we ought to be worshipping on Saturday. And some people have come to that conclusion. They realize that Sunday is not the Sabbath, but they want to keep the Ten Commandments, and one of those is you've got to keep the Sabbath, and so therefore they worship on Saturday. But folks, our motivation is not the law of Moses. Our motivation is our relationship to Christ. Our motivation is not law, but love. And the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, which has redeemed us from the curse of the law. You can't take part of the Sabbath and plunk it down onto Sunday. James tells us that concerning the law, he that offends in one point is guilty of all. Did you light a fire on the Sabbath? Have you gone more than a Sabbath day journey? Your car, when you drove here, did there, were there sparks going on in the engine as the gasoline exploded? Did you cook on the Sabbath? Or as many who have added, like the Jewish Pharisees, traditions of man to the law, the hedge about the law, the 613 different things that the rabbis added so that they would make sure that people obeyed the law. I had a man in one church many, many, many years ago who believed that reading a newspaper on Sunday was a violation of the Sabbath. One who believed that watching a baseball game on Sunday was a violation of the Sabbath. I can remember on that first issue hearing a preacher in North Jersey, still there I believe, still alive and kicking, preaching on that issue of reading a newspaper on Sunday. He was on the radio, same radio station that I was on at the time. He said, did you read the newspaper this Sunday? Sabbath breaker! A Reformed Baptist. Dear people, how we strain at the minutia and miss the weightier matters for which we are accountable. And so we move into Sabbatarianism. Paul deals with that issue in Romans chapter 14 also. The very next verse, beginning in verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Now let me emphasize this last phrase. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Do you know what that implies? that we are permitted to come to different conclusions. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. And now he parallels it with what he said in verses 1 through 4. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. In this set of two verses, we learn four more principles. The first key issue is a man's conscience which he should not violate. One man, it's perfectly okay with his conscience. Another man, it's not okay with his conscience. Now remember, we're adding that to the issue of <laughs> causing a weaker brother to stumble, which he's already dealt with in verses 1 through 4. So now we have the principle, now we have the issue of the conscience. Conscience. 
maybe you will have an okay conscience with doing something. In the first case of eating meat or not eating meat. Or in the second case of having one day special or not having one day special. Because you know you're no longer under the law. But you better make sure whatever you're doing, it's with a clear conscience. The second key issue is the reason he does what he does. He does it unto the Lord, it says. Are you doing it to be a pain to somebody else? Are you doing it to insist on your rights and try to force someone else to do it? The reason, and the only valid reason, is we are doing it unto the Lord, no matter which side you fall on. The third key issue is the way his action, his non-action, or his interaction affects the rest of the church. This is where we get to the principle that I spoke of earlier, whereby those who are mature in their faith should be willing to restrict their Christian liberty so as not to harm a weaker brother. Remember, that's the first principle he talked about in verses 1 through 4. The willingness to restrict our liberty so as not to cause offense to a weaker Christian brother. The fourth key issue is how it affects his testimony for the Lord. Not in this passage, but in other passages, which we hope to get to tonight. I don't think we'll have time. I can't see that clock back there. But I think that we're about out of time. Can, yes, it's 8.15. My wife nodded, yes. So the question is how it affects your testimony for the Lord. But that third issue is the question of stumbling blocks and the restriction of our Christian liberty. Verse 13 and 14. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, back to the food issue, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Study Romans chapter 14. Study 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I hope we'll talk about that next week. By the way, because we have to have a balance here, I'm going to add one thing before we close. When he says, I'm persuaded that nothing is unclean of itself, um, he's not talking about sexual sin. This is not a discussion of sexual sin, which God says is unclean. It is a discussion of food. Because the very next verse says, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. I just had to add that, so we have our balance. Balancing the Christian life is so important, especially as you grow in faith, so that you won't cause weaker brothers to stumble so that you don't insist on your rights and arrogantly trample under feet others who are seeking to grow in Christ. Well, we have to stop there. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. How we thank you for these issues which were hammered out in detail in the book of Acts. Things that dealt with food. Things that dealt with the uncircumcised, the Gentiles. Things that dealt with whether or not Something has to be considered special like the Old Testament Sabbath. And Father, you've given us great and precious principles here in your word that apply not only to these issues, but which apply to many other things in the Christian life. For every generation has its various shibboleths and its various things that are Ichabod. Father, we pray that you will help us to be mature Christians Christians who are growing day by day in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and who focus on the things that are essential and that are important to you so that we might manifest forth Christ in all his beauty and his glory to a world 
that is dead in trespasses and sins so that we might express Christ clearly to them that they might hear and understand your word by the regenerative power of your spirit and be irresistibly drawn to the Savior who is altogether lovely. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.